Good evening, I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's my great pleasure this evening to welcome Prime Minister Bertie Ahern to, Ireland, to Harvard, from Ireland to Harvard. Uh, since 1997, Tishak Ahern has been a major player in the Irish peace process, working together with Tony Blair in finding common ground among the political parties in Northern Ireland and between London and Dublin. Uh, soon after he came into office, he helped to bring about a ceasefire by the IRA, and in 1998, played a decisive role in brokering the Good Friday Peace Agreement. He also supported the incorporation of amendments to the Irish Constitution that symbolically ended the Republic's claim to the North and has long been one of the most controversial areas of the dispute. We're fortunate to have Bertie Ahern here with us at this crucial time in the various peace endeavors. Uh, his recent moves toward decommissioning on the part of the IRA and the re-election of David Trimble, who's committed to the Good Friday Agreement, uh, have been noticed today as moving in the right direction. And we very much hope that these developments will continue to bring Ireland closer to lasting peace. The Kennedy School has a long-standing commitment to furthering the peace process in Ireland. Beginning in 1996, the project here on justice in times of transition brought together leaders of Northern Ireland Irish political parties with members of the parties from the Republic of Ireland and Britain. We also, since 1996, have had a program for young leaders from Ireland and Northern Ireland that's brought young government and civil society leaders to Harvard each year. And this year, the program has included some 40 participants. Tonight, it's also my privilege to announce a new fellowship program that will support students from both Northern Ireland and the Republic to pursue degrees here at the Kennedy School. The Ireland Fellows Program will provide matching fellowships from students or students from both North and South in hope of fostering a trans-border community of public leaders dedicated to peace in Northern Ireland. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Diddy and John Cullinane, who have generously agreed to donate the lead gift in the first Ireland Fellowships. John, would you stand up, please? We hope that this fellowship program will combine the idealism and the common sense pragmatism that have characterized the Ahern leadership in Ireland. And with that, please join me in welcoming Prime Minister Taoiseach Bertie Ahern. Thank you very much, and it's a great honor to be here. Uh, Dean Nye and Senator Pryor, D Dean McCarthy, Ambassador Sean O'Higgin, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for the welcome. I want to thank you for the opportunity of uh, being uh, with you this evening and uh, to address the Forum of Public Affairs and the Kennedy School of, of Government and Harvard University and to uh, give you some of, of my thoughts and some of my views on uh, some of the issues that uh, has been outlined that I've been involved in for the last number of years. And, I suppose more importantly to try to answer uh, some of your questions and uh, I know that some people in this audience are very, very familiar uh, with issues uh, to do with Ireland. I know that uh, this college, as uh, the Dean has said, has given a great uh, interest and great attention uh, to matters uh, to do with Ireland and I know there are others perhaps have just a, a scant view of it. Uh, so I'll, I'll do my utmost to, uh, to make a sense of what been, we've been at. Uh, but I'd like at the outset to thank uh, President Summers and the Kennedy School of Government for uh, inviting me to, uh, to speak here at Harvard this evening. Uh, the reputation of this uh, great university as a seat of learning and education has travelled uh, around the world, uh, and we in Ireland take considerable pride in our many Irish links across this uh, campus, including through visiting Professor and Nobel Laureate Seamus Heaney and your uh, Celtic Studies Department, uh, which has brought a, a love of Irish studies to this side of the Atlantic for uh, well over 100 years. Uh, and thousands of Irish graduates have, have been profoundly enriched by the Harvard experience uh, in many fields of learning over all of that time and have in turn brought their experience home. And I know there's uh, still uh, many Irish people uh, that have been here. And needless to say, in true Irish tradition, uh, before I left home uh, in the last few days and since the Irish media 
carry that I would be here. Uh, I think I've got nearly all the parents of every Irish student here to tell me to send their best wishes. So whether you're here or not tonight, uh, I have sent my best wishes and I can <laughs> gladly tell everyone in Ireland I've done my piece. <laughs> so I think those links, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are, are not confined, of course, to the, to the classroom. Uh, but reach across the, the sports fields uh, too. No doubt the fact that Harvard's football team is captained by Brendan Fitzgerald, uh, coached by Tim Murphy, is having a good effect on your current season. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to congratulate Harvard on the important new initiative uh, the Ireland Fellows Programme announced tonight. And I want to thank John uh, Cullinan, uh, a great leader uh, in Boston, a very accomplished businessman for his generosity. Uh, which reflects so clearly his interest in the future of our young people, north and south, and his pride uh, in Irish heritage. So uh, thank you, John, and it is appreciated. <clears throat> Dean, prior to my departure from Ireland, I, I read uh, that no less a figure of President John Adams was somewhat intimidated uh, by the prospect of the Harvard entrance exam, uh, something uh, that has clearly been overcome uh, by all of you here. But he recalled that, and I quote, he was so terrified at the, the thought of introducing himself to the president and fellows of the college, and I'm sure the dean too, uh, I had first resolved to return home, but for seeing the grief of my father, I rused myself and collected resolution uh, enough to proceed, end of quote. Therefore, dean, uh, I appreciate all the more your kind in introduction uh, and opportunity of being with you. I'm especially pleased to be here at the, the Kennedy School of Government, where uh, so many fine leaders in, in public service and many future leaders uh, among us this evening have chosen to dedicate themselves to uh, this invaluable work because of the, the legacy and the ideals expressed by the former president. And I know that in the Kennedy School that mission has been nurtured and strengthened uh, over many years. It's uh, very familiar to us in in Ireland, what has, has happened, and I've had opportunity at many, many functions uh, in the 25 years uh, almost that uh, I've been a member of the Irish Parliament of uh, meeting people connected and listening to people connected uh, with the Kennedy School. And it's right, I think, that we take every opportunity uh, to promote a greater understanding and dialogue between uh, the academic and the uh, political spheres. At such a challenging and uncertain time, Dean, it's more important than ever to have such a an inspiring example uh, to guide our way. Uh, Ireland and the United States uh, share a very long and uh, close history, uh, and much of it is, is revolving around this great state of Massachusetts uh, in the uh, at least three centuries since the Irish first began arriving here. Uh, we have both witnessed extraordinary change and have grown accustomed to a world where the uh, rapid pace of development uh, constantly uh, alters uh, the way we live. Uh, there was a time that uh, I used to think that uh, everybody uh, from Ireland just came to Massachusetts uh, and that nobody ever went uh, anywhere else because there were so many uh, connections. But as you grow older in Ireland, you realise that it's just most people have a connection with Massachusetts. But until September the 11th, ladies and gentlemen, I think we uh, almost took progress uh, for granted. Uh, on that morning, a tragedy of unspeakable proportions uh, stopped us uh, in our tracks and in the space uh, of just a, a few a short but terrifying hours, uh, it changed the world as uh, we knew it forever. And, and that day, in the words of President Bush, night fell on a different world. And as I said to the Dean and his colleagues earlier on, uh, we have to keep on working and, and moving. But at the same time, I understand uh, only too well how difficult it is and also understand uh, that that uh, will take a considerable time. Uh, we in Ireland, like everywhere else, uh, in the world watched uh, with horror as the tragedy unfolded in Ireland, in Boston, in New England, America, and around the world, a sense of shock and loss is still profound and will remain so, I think, for a long time. But the National Day of Mourning in Ireland on September 14th, uh, which uh, for uh, those of you who, who know Ireland was uh, something that was quite unbelievable because the country just stopped and nobody uh, nobody worked that day, even the emergency services that normally would work on uh, other national holidays stopped. And I think because people just attempted to give as best they could an expression to the enormous outpouring of our grief and to articulate our sympathy, our support and solidarity uh, with you, with our friends and our family in the United States. And your loss is ours and 
Uh, we mourn as you do, and uh, we continue uh, to uh, watch closely uh, all of the events, but I think just tonight, uh, without uh, saying it too many times, uh, our heart goes out for all of those people uh, who lost their lives and for uh, just the thousands and thousands and thousands of, of families and bereaved people uh, all over the United States uh, who have to continue living this, not just for a period, but forever. Uh, we utterly condemn these appalling terrorist acts. We stand with you and with the rest of the international community in asserting that those who perpetrated them uh, cannot be allowed to succeed. Uh, we must all work together to eradicate the scourge uh, and governments everywhere must uh, dedicate their total commitment uh, to this task. Uh, international solidarity, Dean, in the fight against terrorism is, is crucial at this time. And we firmly believe that the United Nations uh, has a pivotal role to play in achieving this. Uh, Ireland was elected to the UN Security Council uh, for 2001 and 2002. We took its seat, our seat in January last, and the Security Council acted swiftly and uh, decisively in the immediate aftermath of September 11th. And during the month of October, uh, following the attacks and directly following the attacks, uh, Ireland have held the presidency of the Security Council. Uh, and we have been uh, deeply engaged as a small country in uh, helping to shape the Council's response uh, to the atrocities. Our position has been steadfast and clear. Uh, there's no place for uh, terrorism in the modern world. And uh, we have just been uh, honoured, but not the way we wanted it to be able to play uh, a significant role as President of the Security Council. And we continue to play uh, that role uh, away from the Presidency, but as members of the Security Council uh, into uh, and up to the end of next year, the end of next year. In compliance, Dean, with UN Resolution 1368, uh, we must do everything in our power to bring those who perpetrated these vile acts to justice. Uh, we must rid the world forever of such attacks. We must put permanent barriers in place across the uh, entire international community, which will comprehensively put an end to uh, terrorism and its capacity to operate. On the Security Council, we have overseen the establishment of the committee uh, to set up and monitor the implementation of Resolution 1373 uh, governing this work. And finally, as uh, countless UN resolutions as yet unimplemented confirm, we must address the uh, underlying causes of conflict and tensions and address uh, those issues which terrorists exploit uh, for their own ends. The, in the countries participating in the uh, military actions now underway in response to Afghanistan rightly uh, came to the Security Council to outline their course of action. And during October, uh, we arranged for the Council to focus on the situation in Afghanistan at two levels, on the humanitarian needs of the people and the urgency of putting a political settlement in place in which the United Nations must play a key part, part as, and key role. And your President said yesterday he looks to the United Nations to, to play that role. And as far as the humanitarian needs are concerned, I believe that all of us in the international community share the same genuine concerns, and every effort is being made to respond to the real needs to the, of the ordinary people in Afghanistan, and particularly as, as winter uh, fast approaches. And like the United States, Ireland has made a, a renewed bilateral commitment to helping the vulnerable people of that country with their humanitarian needs, uh, particularly uh, as we head, in, head into these uh, winter uh, months that are ahead, and uh, we all, I think, have known, have seen the kind of weather, uh, if we were not familiar with it before, uh, that Afghans, uh, suffers, Afghanistan suffers, the droughts of the summer and the uh, ferocious uh, hard winters. So the humanitarian situation will, of course, uh, only be properly resolved in the context of a, a political settlement, which is a prerequisite for uh, long-term peace and stability there. Uh, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Representative is currently engaged in trying to find a comprehensive solution to that crisis, and we are working with him uh, in this effort. Obviously, that is going to take time. Obviously, uh, it is going to take a lot of patience and work, but it is important as the military action uh, goes ahead and rightly goes ahead that we build on the humanitarian issues and build on the uh, political initiatives as well. But in the words of President Kennedy, uh, peace does not rest in the charters and covenants alone. It lies in the hearts and minds of, of all people, as he said. Uh, and enduring peace and stability will take a long time to establish. But a strong democratic process is the only sustainable way 
uh, to end support for those who use violence to achieve their objectives. From our own experience uh, on the road to peace in Northern Ireland, uh, it's shown us that it's ultimately the power of uh, democratic politics and policies that has the capacity to address the underlying causes of, of conflict and division. Uh, for over 30 years, uh, 30 consecutive uh, difficult years, the people of Northern Ireland endured a, a bewildered, be bewildering cycle of terror, uh, of violence, of loss uh, for many years now and indeed uh, with the ongoing support and encouragement of our friends here in the United States. We have worked closely with the British government, with the political parties in Northern Ireland to fulfil the, the political vacuum with solace and inclusive democratic structures which could attract the support of all the people there no matter what their persuasion, regardless whether they were uh, nationalists, uh, they were republicans, they were loyalists or, or uh, they were uh, unionist uh, persuasion. And we've worked hard to bring ceasefires about and to put a process of negotiation in place. And of course, uh, when you're working from a position of, of 30 years of ongoing terrorism, where uh, practically every day for 30 years, the uh, morning news brought the events of the night before, uh, who was shot, who was killed, uh, who was blown up, uh, what innocent person uh, walking home. Uh, with, with their girlfriend in the evening was just taken out and shot because they were a Catholic or they were a Protestant, uh, what um, house had been targeted because they were of one religion or another, or one persuasion or another, uh, what workmen had been picked out because they were easy targets and just killed on building sites, what milkman was uh, shot because it happened to be easy to get milkmen early in the morning, or what night worker was shot on the way home. That's the way it was for, for 30 years. And of course, when things got rough, uh, and it wasn't good enough to just kill one person here and there. Uh, they st would stick a bomb uh, in some location and blow a dozen up or, or do whatever. Um, and uh, that just went on for, for 30 years and, and the cycle would go on and on. And the worse it would get, of course, somebody, as we said in, in Ireland, for tit for tat, uh, if somebody got five, the others had to get six. If someone got seven, the others had to get eight. Uh, and on and on it went. But the historic Good Friday Agreement of uh, 1998 was a, a major step forward and it changed the political landscape on the island of Ireland forever and for the better. Uh, we're very proud of the achievement. We're especially proud of the fact that our work was endorsed loudly and clearly by the uh, overwhelming majority of the people on the island of Ireland um, on the same day when uh, they exercised their sovereign right and voted in favour of the agreement on the 22nd of May in 1998. Uh, that was the first time since 1918, 80 years earlier, that the people uh, north and south voted uh, on the same issue uh, on the same occasion, or on any occasion uh, for that matter. Um, the, in drafting the Good Friday Agreement, Dean, under the chairmanship of, of George Mitchell, uh, we sought to construct a, a model uh, for the future uh, which would tolerate, uh, appreciate and accommodate difference. Because uh, in Northern Ireland, there's just an enormous amount of difference. Difference not only of 30 years of violence, but difference of, of hundreds of years um, of uh, community uh, relationships going uh, the wrong direction. And we were sought to replace violence and uh, sterile polarisation uh, with political engagement, uh, with reconciliation and with uh, reproachment, and to create a context in which uh, trust, mutual respect and equality uh, could flourish. Age-old concepts of victory and defeat had to be replaced by unfamiliar processes of, of dialogue and compromise. Because if you work on the basis of negotiating for victory or defeat, you haven't got a hope. Uh, and all of those who signed the agreement signed up uh, on the, the democratic process, reaffirming their total and absolute commitments to resolving differences to exclusively democratic means. Uh, and on this fundamental principle, ladies and gentlemen, of the exclusive use of democratic processes and the rejection of violence, there was no equivocation, uh, no room for discussion and no place for compromise. Uh, we were absolutely clear that the democratic processes and the rejection of violence uh, had to be at uh, the order of the day. Otherwise, you could not make uh, democracy work or couldn't even start to try to plan uh, to have a democratic process. So in creating uh, a fresh start, we addressed uh, many conflicting fundamental issues and assumptions. And we tried to 
accommodate uh, the different strands of the, the complex relationships that underlie uh, the conflict down through the years. We agreed that there would be no change to the status of Northern Ireland without the uh, consent of the majority there. As the Dean has said, that was a, a difficult thing for us to do. Uh, I had to spend uh, hours and ends uh, with my own party, not to mind, in the campaign to sell the agreement, to explain to people uh, why we needed to do that, uh, to explain to people that we had to uh, trust, we had to move forward, and we had to make initiatives from the Irish government side if we were going to make uh, progress on the other side. In the South, we changed our constitution to reflect this, removing, as those of you are familiar, removing Articles 2 and 3 uh, and reinserting uh, new clauses. But we also agreed that change was possible and that if a majority voted in the future for a united Ireland, the governments would give effect to their wishes. So nobody was giving up their belief on what they wanted to see uh, in the future, but they were accepting that it could only be done on the basis of consent and only could be done by the democratic wishes of the people in Northern Ireland alone. The British government also changed its constitution legislation to reflect the primacy of the people's wishes in matters of sovereignty. We created democratically elected, accountable institutions in Northern Ireland to respond to the needs of the people, and where all sides could work together positively and pragmatically, delivering a tangible evidence that democratic policies work. We developed North-South institutions uh, to reflect the and accommodate the vast reservoir of goodwill and positive cooperations that exist on the island of Ireland and to reflect uh, the all-Ireland dimension, uh, working together uh, on issues uh, that are not just the burning political issues of the day, uh, but working on issues of tourism, a small island, why we couldn't work together to uh, market ourselves as, uh, for tourism as an all-Ireland entity, uh, working on cooperation on electricity, on, on gas, on infrastructure of other kinds, uh, working on uh, cooperation in education and in health. Uh, so issues where uh, it made no sense and was not of great political hostility uh, to share and work together. Uh, and they were the, the kind of areas that we spelt out for North-South cooperation. We created a British-Irish Council to reflect the, the broader context of relationship within the islands of Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, to try to change the attitude and the atmosphere uh, where it was us and them, uh, where uh, Ireland and Britain uh, all the time seemed to be at each other's throats, that where we could actually sit down and discuss things that affected us as, as close neighbours and that we could uh, come to mutual understandings and issues. We've talked about issues on, on drugs and uh, issues about our role in Europe and uh, how the uh, our fishery policies and other issues can, can work into the future. That's very much at the beginning, but we've spelt out uh, issues where we can, we can work in a non-legalistic way, working as friends uh, and where we can cooperate together. Uh, since then, Dean, we've been working together to ensure that the agreement can achieve its promise, uh, that it can be allowed to work comprehensively. And as many uh, friends in the United States and successive administrations who have supported us throughout these efforts know only too well it's not always been easy. After the turmoil of so many centuries, it could not possibly have been otherwise, uh, but we have persevered because we know that we're on the right path at last. Uh, people from outside of Ireland and people who are not too familiar with Ireland always ask me, you know, when did this problem start? Was it 30 years ago? And I said, no, it wasn't uh, quite uh, 30 uh, years ago, it was slightly earlier than that, and, uh, and I said, well, then was it when the civil, civil war was on in the early 20s? And well, I said, that was a part of the problem. They said, well, well it must have been the great revolution and rising of, of 1916. And um, well, it wasn't quite that time either, and it depends how long you want to go back. So in actual fact, it's whenever you want to go to. Uh, but it has been a, a long, long process of 1641, 1798. And there's one thing uh, in Ireland that they have very, very good memories for or our history, so it's better not to go back uh, too far. Um, so uh, I, I tend to say now um, it all started with the Good Friday Agreement. We try and move forward, uh, uh, and let's try and start from somewhere. But throughout the process, uh, a number of problems, um, I think, showed progress in, in fully establishing the institutions of the agreement and ensuring uh, that it could operate inclusively and be implemented in full. 
Uh, there's no question that the issue of putting illegal arms beyond use has been particularly difficult for both sides. It has, and came to symbolise the lack of trust and the deficit of confidence uh, that existed uh, between the sides. For unionists, the retention of illegal weapons represented a lack of commitment to the democratic process. For Republicans, the preoccupation with the issue uh, fed the suspicion that there was a deep reluctance by unionists to fully share power. And whatever the rights and wrongs, because we could be here till tomorrow night arguing the rights and wrongs, but the reality was uh, that the failure to put arms beyond use became so entangled with the issue of self-government that the fledging institutions of democracy had to struggle to survive. In February of last year, in February 2000, following the temporary suspension of the institutions, and the Irish Government came to the conclusion that we had to broaden the context in order to find a way out of our difficulties. And together with the British Government, we focused our efforts and our energies on identifying the outstanding areas of the agreement where implementation had not been achieved and redoubled our efforts uh, to resolve those issues. Earlier this summer, many of you would be familiar that at Weston Park in, in England, we sat down with the parties to find uh, a way out of the impasse. Uh, and following uh, several days and uh, nights uh, of intensive discussions, we identified four outstanding issues which we believe held the key to trying to make a, a breakthrough. Decommissioning, uh, as we say, decommissioning of arms, um, dealing with the issue of putting illegal arms beyond use, uh, demilitarisation, which was uh, basically the removing of the security, of the official security infrastructure that has been uh, built up in uh, Northern Ireland through, through the, the years, uh, policing, uh, bringing uh, a new police service across community, uh, police service to Northern Ireland, one that would be uh, trusted and respected by everybody, where the police that will serve in it in the future will be able to put police uh, as policemen anywhere else in the world can, uh, where they can have trust and confidence regardless of the, or the ordinary difficulties that police have everywhere in the world, but that would be able to be in a respected way, uh, do their job uh, to the best of their ability and have the respect of everybody. And the stability of the institutions, so that we wouldn't have this stop-start on off uh, institutions for one reason or another not working as they were planned in the Good Friday Agreement. And since the, party thems the parties themselves were unable to reach full agreement, uh, the two governments put a package of proposals to them on the 1st of August. On the 23rd of October, just gone, uh, the IRA announced that it had started putting its weapons, including arms, ammunition and explosives, uh, completely uh, beyond use. Much as has been said, I think it's only fair uh, that I say that that might have never happened um, if, if the events of the September the 11th had not happened. Uh, I, I just want to be quite honest and frank about that. I, I don't believe that, quite frankly. Uh, I, I am not one who believes that. The last meeting I had uh, on the 11th of September, uh, as I heard of the, uh, the terrible events uh, unfolding early afternoon in Ireland, uh, Martin McGuinness and Gerry Adams were leaving, the two leaders of the Republic movement were leaving my office, uh, and it, I was quite satisfied that we were moving down uh, this, this path. Uh, perhaps it happened uh, some way quicker than it would have, um, and that is a matter of debate or argument. I'm not saying whether it would or not, uh, but I do believe uh, that these things would have, uh, would have moved on anyway. So, but on the 23rd of October, the IRA announced that it had started putting its weapons uh, including arms and uh, explosives and ammunitions completely beyond use, and that was a major, major breakthrough. The independent international body established by the two governments and uh, chaired by uh, Canadian General John de Chastelain to oversee this highly sensitive issue recognised the significance of this uh, truly uh, unprecedented progress in the resolutions of the arms issue. Uh, this historic move uh, breaks a logjam and we believe will now allow the peace process to progress as we had envisaged that it should. We congratulate all those involved, including the Sinn Féin party, in making this progress possible. Uh, others, particularly those paramilitary organisations on both sides of the divide who continue to use violence to articulate their views, including those who intimidate and threaten innocent children on their way to school, uh, must now respond to this new opportunity. And that comment is related to an issue, for those of you who are not familiar with a school in West Belfast, the Ardine, uh, where 11 weeks now, uh, every morning, uh, the 
children gather, uh, Catholic children gather at the end of the street uh, to go uh, to their school. Uh, their primary children under 11. Uh, they uh, parents uh, normally their uh, their mothers, but al also uh, so some of their fathers. Uh, they have to walk through a barrage of sectarian and uh, hostility uh, every day. Uh, they they play before they start. They cry through the process, have their days in school, and in the evening, uh, the same barrage of insults happens. Uh, and of course, uh, there are uh, lots of solutions where they could go other ways. They couldn't go. To, they might not go to school. They could close down the school. Uh, but in Northern Ireland, people do not do that. Uh, people will stand for what they believe in, and they go through this hostility. And really, uh, it's just an unacceptable way if you have an argument to fight or if you have an issue to fight or a cause to fight, which is justifiable for people to fight issues, uh, you do not do it on the back uh, of, of children uh, under 10 years of age uh, and feel that you are fighting any just cause. So uh, I have been continually reiterating that this issue uh, has to be resolved and hopefully we will move to do that fairly soon. Dean, now that we have achieved uh, substantial progress in this crucial area of arms and uh, moving on, we must redouble our efforts to ensure that other outstanding issues relating to the Good Friday Agreement can continue to move forward. For its part, the British Government has responded uh, by taking further important steps towards dismantling the military installations which have scarred the landscape of Northern Ireland and along the border with the Irish Republic for so long. Uh, this is a powerful demonstration to people on the ground that, given the chance, uh, politics can and uh, will deliver positive change, and I welcome that. I welcome the fact that Prime Minister Blair, uh, Secretary of State John Reid, uh, moved so quickly to start dismantling uh, their security infrastructure. The British Government has promised a rolling process of demilitarisation, leading ultimately to a situation where normal levels of security prevail. It is a day uh, we all look forward to in Ireland. And as students of government, you all know that political institutions represent uh, the heart of the democratic process. And seeing them open for business and fully functioning is vital to the future stability of the agreement. The devolved administration and every political party uh, will need to reaffirm their commitment uh, to playing a full and generous part and to ensuring that all others involved are enabled to do likewise. In short, it is through the full and inclusive operation of the institutions that the future of a new society that we are working to achieve uh, will be secured and sustained for the generations ahead. Policing, as I uh, briefly said, is a, is a crucially s sensitive interface between uh, people and the state. And the issue of accountable policing, which has the full confidence of the community it serves, is, of course, at the core of any democracy. If a police service cannot be trusted, if it, if it cannot work, if it cannot function, uh, then it can't serve its people. And then when that happens, people look to others to take that role. And you go into the business of paramilitaries and people taking the, their, the, the law into their own hands. And that's what we've had in Northern Ireland uh, for a long time past. And in Northern Ireland still struggling with its complex and difficult past, it has been widely recognised from the start that a new beginning to policing is vital to, get, to gain the trust and confidence of all parts of the community. And this was fully identified uh, in the Good Friday Agreement in the negotiations that went on from September 1997 to uh, Good Friday of 1998. And the subsequent Patton report, Chris Patton, many of you will uh, know Chris Patton, who was a, a member of a Tory government and, uh, and then uh, the man who handled the Hong Kong situation and independence uh, and the transfer back to, uh, to, to China. Uh, he gave an enormous amount of his time to his eternal credit. It uh, wouldn't be normal that uh, a member of, of my party and my tradition would be uh, praising uh, a high rank and Tory. Uh, but <laughs> I have to say, I take my hat off to Chris Patton. I have great, great regard for Chris Patton. He did a, a wonderful uh, job in the Patton report, and that's why we've been so committed to it, its implementation. It provided the detailed route map to achieve the objective of an acceptable uh, police force. Uh, we believe that the all-important process of delivering this new start to policing is now underway. And last weekend, um, the RUC, uh, as we've known it, has, has moved on now to the new Police Service of Northern Ireland. That's the name, Police Service of Northern Ireland. It came into being with representatives from the nationalists and unionist communities making up its board and its functioning. 
In recent days, new recruits comprising members in equal measure uh, from both communities have joined the Police Service of Northern Ireland. The Police Board will inevitably take time to fully establish itself, but it is vitally important work in making the Police Service uh, fully accountable to all the community uh, is beginning, and I do believe that it will work. The Oversight Commissioner, Tom Constantine, uh, the former Chief of Police of New York State, will publish a review uh, a year into the new agreements, and we will uh, be able to, to see how matters are proceeding and point to uh, I think the need for change in ensuring that the pattern report is fully implemented. Uh, all parts of the community must be involved uh, and enabled to play their full part in future policing arrangements in Northern Ireland. And I hope that in time, uh, Sinn Féin and their community, who have shown such leadership in other areas, uh, will also do so. And I think they will, when all of the aspects that have been negotiated will be implemented. And from the day that it was signed, uh, the Good Friday Agreement has promised a fresh start, ladies and gentlemen, in, in which partnership, equality, uh, mutual respect, uh, reconciliation, re reconciliation, reproachment are the basis on which relationships will be built and sustained. Uh, we've embarked on an enormously important process of change, uh, replacing conflict with uh, political engagement, uh, overcoming the, the visions of the past. And for many, that vision has still to become a reality. But we're totally and utterly committed to seeing it through. It's not sensible to believe that you can just uh, bring in an agreement and explain the agreement and uh, then everyone signs up to it and everyone is happy. It cannot be like that after years and bitterness and legacy of mistrust uh, and uh, raw sectarian hatred, uh, to be honest about it. Uh, but uh, time and progress uh, can uh, be really true. And I must say, last night, uh, I couldn't but help, you mentioned Dean, uh, when uh, I saw uh, members uh, of the SDLP, uh, the uh, Democratic Party, who have been a middle-ranking, non-violent party in Northern Ireland down through all the years, um, the uh, Alliance Party, uh, which has been a non-sectarian, um, again, middle-of-the-road party, might have had its roots more in unionist tradition, but it moved into people from, uh, from both both traditions, but always kept a balance, never considered himself one, one side or the other. Um, uh, Sinn Féin, uh, the Women's Coalition, who represents the broad uh, issues of, of women in Northern Ireland, all celebrating uh, that they had won, uh, and to see them all cheering David Trimble. Uh, and I can tell you it was a, a sight uh, to behold, uh, apart from the few scuffles, which are always part of uh, <laughs> Irish life, and never any... <laughs> Our national game allows you to use your shoulder, so there's nothing wrong with <laughs> and nothing wrong with that. Um, played up a little bit in the international press this morning, but uh, to see that they had uh, beaten some of the other uh, unionist sides, and of course uh, those uh, Republicans who were not there, but or who were who believe that uh, the militant uh, way is still the right way to, to follow on. But there are those, unfortunately, of course, who want to stop the Good Friday Agreement. There's always people who want to stop progress in its tracks. Uh, they're determined to use every device, every opportunity to frustrate uh, progress. They want to return Northern Ireland to the failed, uh, divisive uh, politics of the past. But time has moved on. Uh, there's no going back. Uh, we have a chance to consolidate the peace from which everybody has benefited hugely, and uh, not just in terms of people not dying, not in terms of people having to emigrate. And, people wanting to get away for education reasons and never going back and uh, all of the, the trauma that, that happens for, for families and I'm sure people here uh, and um, for all of the difficulties it does to an economy and the way it ruins an economy. Uh, nobody wants to go back to that. People want to, to build a future that is fair and inclusive uh, for all the people of Northern Ireland regardless of where they come from. Uh, I applaud this week's election as I've said of David Trimble, Mark Durkin. Mark Durkin takes over the position held by she Seamus Mallon, acknowledged the great work of Seamus Mallon. Um, they are now the First Minister, Deputy First Minister of the Northern Ireland Executive. Their election offers real hope. Uh, they face uh, challenges at every turn by the uh, opportunities, I think, and, the, and the, the records. But I'm confident that uh, with the overwhelming support that they enjoy, uh, they will lead Northern Ireland to a better future for all its people that we've worked so hard all these years to achieve. And here, Dean, in the Kennedy School and elsewhere in, in Massachusetts, uh, we have 
lent, I think, real support on our, um, our road at the peace. We've really been helped uh, so much. I've mentioned so many names along the way. You will have noticed Tom Constantine and uh, all of Senator George Mitchell and, and, and so many others, but Senator Kennedy, the, the late Speaker Tip O'Neill and others have made exceptional and generous contributions to the peace process, as have many of our friends throughout the United States, even when optimism was in short supply, I assure you. We particularly appreciate the support and solidarity we've received from successive US administrations and the ongoing commitment and generosity of President Bush, Ambassador Richard Haas, who's been working very closely with us, and our many friends on both sides of the Congress as we continue with this work. We've got extraordinary um, support um, from uh, friends, uh, both in, in education and in commerce and trade uh, and in politics uh, right across uh, the way. The events of September uh, the 11th have, of course, hit uh, the economy uh, badly uh, all over the world. Uh, the full scale of the effects are still uh, not clear and perhaps will not be for some time. As our, late, our largest trading partner, we feel those effects, as you do at a time when the working lives of Irish and American people are more closely integrated than they ever have been before. Uh, America has enjoyed tremendous expansion over the last decade, and we in Ireland have participated in this too. Uh, very much working with you and your success has been uh, certainly our success. So it is right that we face the current uh, challenges together, and we will. Our economy is sound and we're constantly open to uh, investment and to uh, being the best place uh, to do business in Europe. And I think many businesses from Massachusetts have, have uh, followed that and been very helpful to us in the process. Uh, Ireland's membership of the European Union is fundamental to our national interests and to our uh, people's peace and prosperity going forward. In that context, the, the quality of trade, uh, political and economic relations between US and Europe is a critical success factor for, uh, for us. Uh, I want Ireland to continue to be at the leading edge of the excellent relationships between the European Union and the US. Uh, we worked hard this very year uh, to even make that closer and closer. We cannot allow occasional difficulties in any specific area to obscure the benefits uh, and importance of the transatlantic relationship between the European Union and America. Each conflict has its own unique origins, issues and solutions. And this great nation rose above the conflict and visions of its day. And at this time of year, when we remember the millions of people who lost their lives in World War I, we we're reminded of the great achievements of the European Union in bringing a peace to Europe, a precious privilege uh, that no previous generation in Europe has been able to uh, enjoy. And at this challenging time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be able to bring you a message of hope in the, the peace process in, in Ireland. We understand the importance of this in the, the midst of a, a difficult international situation when pressing problems requiring the direct attention of the United States are engaging uh, so much attention. Uh, we've been very closely involved in Ireland in the Middle East process as well. We've obviously had a lot of dealings as well with our colleagues in, in Africa where so many Irish missionaries, both lay and uh, religious are, are involved in, and uh, we take a, a particular interest in, in these issues. And uh, we almost, I think, work together to try to, uh, to find solutions. Uh, tomorrow, I look forward, Dean, to briefing President Bush uh, on developments and to thanking him for his and his unstinting support, even at a time uh, of, of trauma in, in your own country, where uh, he, he through uh, Ambassador Haas, has continued to help us through September, October, uh, even with all of the difficulties. We, in turn, look forward to working with the United States in our capacity, and not only in the European Union, not only as a, a very friendly country with an enormous contacts with the United States, uh, but in our role in the United Nations, where we believe we can play a very significant role and believe that we are. And whatever challenges uh, we may face uh, in the world around us, our relationship and shared belief, ladies and gentlemen, in the strength and values uh, of democracy our common goal of eradicating evil wherever and whenever it's manifested it will not change. Thank you.
now have time for a few questions. <clears throat> there are two microphones on the floor here and two halfway up to the balcony. And uh, may I ask you to identify yourself and your relationship to the university as you ask your question, and please keep your questions brief and to the point. So let me start uh, here. Hi, my name is Tony Vila, an undergraduate at the college. I was wondering if you had any comments on the participation of the European Union in the conflict and more what this might say of a while, what the European Union's responsibility regarding other ethnic conflicts in Central Europe is. Well, I, I, th I think the European Union position on, on the conflict has, has been very clear uh, from, the, uh, from the outset. And Ireland's position, I think, has been at idem with that. Um, the European Union's position is that um, Article 51 uh, of, of the United Nations a Charter uh, allows uh, the United States to en engage in self-defence, uh, that uh, the rest of the international community has an obligation to defeat terrorism uh, and to work with it. Uh, and I think this is a, an experience that brings us all together uh, to do that, to, to, to try and do our utmost to eradicate uh, terrorism and, and to work together to do that, uh, and understanding uh, that all of the time we uh, have to uh, do our utmost, as I said earlier on, looking at the humanitarian aspects, looking at the political aspects, but also to be uh, endeavouring to, uh, to target and uh, to do all of the things I think the United States are, are doing and to uh, avoid in so far as is possible a uh, civilian life. But I think the, uh, the, the cooperation and the need to work together uh, right across Europe. We've had uh, two uh, special meetings. Uh, in Ghent and in Brussels uh, over the, the last five or six weeks, and there's an enormous determination uh, to work uh, together uh, under and within the remit of the United Nations on this issue. How it affects uh, other um, disputes, uh, I, I would hope uh, that conflict everywhere perhaps will benefit from the, the terrible uh, deeds that, that have happened, because I think there's an opportunity for people perhaps to look at other conflicts and see how uh, one conflict is, is related to, a, to another and to see uh, how people can help. I had an opportunity uh, recently of meeting President Arafat. Uh, my colleague, the Foreign Minister, Brian Cowan, was with President Arafat uh, the day uh, that the, uh, of the, uh, the terrible events of September 11th. And, uh, he has been so strong in his condemnation at that very press conference just after that meeting. And uh, he is calling out for uh, for help, uh, and I, I know Israel have uh, their, their, their difficulties, and, and I know that Simon Perez uh, is, is endeavouring to uh, to work together in this present day uh, to try and to, to, to help to find um, with Mr. Sharon uh, some resolutions. But I think we we have to try and find uh, resolutions to these issues. These people do not want to be engaged uh, as a leadership; they want to lead people away from these things. So I just hope in that conflict and so many others. Uh, in our presidency uh, of the, in the month of October, in, in spite of all that was happening, you just look at a number of conflicts across the world, uh, and I think we, we, we festering conflicts like the Northern Ireland one I've explained, but in other ones, they do they they do happen and create the circumstances where evil people can get away with things, and I, I just think we have to to work so hard together to try to deal with these issues, and I hope that the United Nations. Um, which I think there's a new lease of life into it to try to deal with issues, will deal with them. I'm Anne Hinnon. I'm a mid-career student at the Kennedy School. Um, and as you can probably hear, I'm from Dublin. Um, I had several questions I was going to ask you, Taoiseach, but uh, you, in your very comprehensive speech, you've answered them all. So I'll just ask you if you would comment on the recent statements by President Bush uh, to the effect that all nations um, must be held accountable for their inaction and that no nation can remain neutral in this conflict? Well, I've been saying at home and saying the European Union, uh, nobody can be, while well, we're in Ireland, are a neutral country uh, because we're not part of any military alliance, but nobody can be neutral on terrorism uh, and nobody should be neutral on terrorism. Uh, and that, that's our, our position. Uh, terrorism is wrong wherever it is, whether it kills one person or whether it kills 4,400 people, uh, and I think we, we, we all have to, uh, to, to work on it. And I think the President's made some valid points about all the conventions uh, that have been there for many decades that 
haven't been passed, where people perhaps haven't cooperated as much. Uh, and there's an enormous amount of work to, to be done. Uh, we have in Lacken, um, in, in, in Belgium, in mid-December, we have a progress report, and the Justice Home Affairs uh, Ministers, week previous to that, 7th of December, across Europe, uh, looking at the, the UN resolutions that have been passed and implementing them. Because the trouble is, uh, people can uh, write very good resolutions, you can write, very write good objectives and aims, um, but it's like a business person. Um, I'm sure in the business uh, here, Mr. Conan and, and others in his, in his business, he wouldn't be a successful businessman if he wrote down aims and objectives and then did not anything about them. Uh, and I think what we have to do is implement them. Uh, and I think that's what the President is saying, and I agree with him. Hello, my name is Genevieve Shri, and I'm in the undergraduate program here at the college. Um, I was wondering, uh, very soon we're going to see the integration of the euro as a hard currency into Ireland and what impact do you think this will have uh, not only on Ireland as a nation but also if in the future the UK was to adopt the euro, what impact that would have? And I'm trying to get at my friend uh, Tony Blair, I say um, 1st of January we'll be the only English speaking country in Europe that will have the euro in but uh, <laughs> he doesn't like me saying that so I wouldn't say it here. <laughs> Um, I, I, th I think, it, it, wh why is the euro there? The euro is there is to bring stability. Uh, will it work? Yes, it will. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the, if you looked at what happened um, over the last five or six weeks, uh, the, the euro was held very firm. Uh, there hasn't been great turbulence in the financial markets in, in Europe. You could imagine what would have happened and what did happen in, in 1992 um, when uh, there was speculation uh, and there was enormous turbulence. Not alone was there devalu devaluations, there was several devaluations and revaluations and in the end the whole exchange rate mechanism of Europe collapsed in, in the summer of, of 1993. Um, now we've had a position where we've had low interest rates, a stability uh, and I think Wim Dysonberg, the President of the European Central Bank, there has been a, a tremendous display uh, of being able to manage uh, a currency, a new currency, some difficulties, but in a very difficult position. And not alone were they able to hold that position, but they were able to help the liquidity of the dollar, which was a very tricky few days where people were obviously looking at the, the human aspects, but there was a few very difficult days in the financial markets after September 11. So uh, I think uh, it, it, the purposes of the euro uh, were stability, uh, price stability, uh, to bring order uh, to uh, and fix the, the currencies and, and fix them at a, at a fixed rate for, for the future. So uh, it, it will help. Uh, I do think uh, that Tony Blair will, will finally uh, get around uh, to having a referendum. Uh, and we're all in favour of, of him joining the Euro, and, and the sooner the better. And I'd even go and help him in the campaign. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Maureen Shan, and I'm a senior in the college. Um, I'm wondering your thoughts on the Westminster June elections um, in which the DUP and Sinn Féin increased their support, while the more mainstream pro um, parties like the UUP, um, SDLP sort of softened as well as Alliance. Um, it, it's, it's probably, uh, from my perspective, I, I, I don't like to see the, uh, the, the the outsides um, do do well, but I have to say I, I, I am pleased to see them all involved in democratic politics, and, and that's probably if they're away from violence, uh, then I'm pleased to, to see it. But in fairness, uh, sometimes if, if you're not uh, out there shouting and roaring about something or another, uh, but you're in there constructively working, uh, you can get marginalised. Uh, and I know that the uh, parties uh, like the UUP uh, and the SCLP that uh, feel that that's what happens, that they're there trying to make things work and because uh, they're not doing as much jumping up as down as others, but uh, that they get marginalised. But anyway, uh, that's, that's a bit of politics, you know, and I suppose the person who jumps up and down gets more uh, notice. If you're jumping up and down enough, the camera keeps jumping up and down with you, so you get on TV more often. Uh, but if they're all in politics, I'd have to say the serious thing is, if they're all in politics, having been at a position where the marginalisation of, of public life in, in the north was that it was through the barrel of a gun or, or through people roaring and shouting at each other uh, through loud hailers. If they're all running for elections, then I have no complaint. Uh, in the final end of the day, if it's democratic politics and people are putting their names up for ballot and they're fighting a democratic election, uh, that's fine by me. And regardless who wins, I think you have to accept it because that's better than the alternative.
My name is John Fitzgerald. I live in West Groton. I am a member of the general public. <laughs> the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 calls for the release of prisoners who were incarcerated for politically motivated offenses, which occurred prior to its formal approval. In the six counties, this stipulation has been met. In the South, it has not. I speak of the Castlereagh Five. They were convicted of offenses which occurred on June 7, 1996, and they remain in prison. Why have the Castlereagh Five not been released, and when will they be released? Uh, well, John, to, to be frank, I hope not for a long time. Um, it, 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 it's it's um, the, the Castlereagh Five uh, were, uh, in some form or another, um, involved or engaged in the uh, atrocities uh, that led to the uh, murder uh, of, of two uh, Gardaí, um, detective Gardaí, uh, who were minding a, a truck uh, in the Dare in County Limerick. Um, there were, the, the court actions uh, of this did not uh, prove them uh, guilty of murder. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that they were part of, of an overall group uh, who, who was guilty, who did it, uh, as a matter remains on the question mark um, uh, basis. But from the very start, the Irish government said um, that, uh, that they, were, w they would not be considered by us to be part of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, there is a court action. Uh, th there is a court case being taken, uh, John, to, to challenge that, to say what you've just said, that they are part of the Good Friday Agreement. But uh, we've argued that, that that is not the case, and, uh, and as you know, John, uh, and obviously you're, you're well you're well briefed on what you've said on this, um, uh, when they gunned down those two detectives that morning uh, that were just moving uh, a truck, um, it, it, it was denied that they were a part of the Republican movement, and it was a so considerable time later uh, when it was declared uh, that they were a part of the Republican movement. Now, we have been quite uh, lenient on them uh, in that they're, they're effectively uh, in a semi-open prison. Uh, they're not being treated uh, as our prisoners would have been in the past. But for us to release them uh, would, would not, not be something that, that, that we would uh, uh, likely do uh, for the foreseeable future. Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Amit Borde. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, you mentioned uh, and concluded your speech by saying how United Nations can play an important role, and Ireland itself has been at the helm of affairs at the Security Council for a while. Uh, my question to you is, uh, do you think, uh, as uh, leading the country which heads the Security Council, that the United States should have gone first to the Security Council for a resolution uh, before starting the military attacks? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't, because they were, they were quite entitled uh, under uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter, uh, based, uh, and it is, it's, it's, it's very clear, based on, on self-defense, to take the action uh, that they, uh, they did take. Uh, but they, they did go to the, to the Security Council um, at our behest on the 7th of, of exactly a month today, on, on the 7th of October, uh, to outline the, the action. We, we appreciated uh, that they did that. Um, but they were clearly within the, the UN um, mandate. They did not need a, a separate resolution. And anyway, uh, Resolution 1368 um, uh, well uh, covers uh, the, the action not only in, in Afghanistan, uh, but wherever uh, they would uh, believe and had information uh, that they could substantiate uh, where uh, terrorism or the threat of terrorism was against. Now, they haven't. Uh, they haven't endeavoured to extend that, which I'm glad they haven't. Uh, but I mean, they would be still within their entitlement. But in relation to, to, to um, their evidence on Afghanistan, um, it was clearly within um, Article 51. Uh, and I, I, I do not think, uh, quite frankly, I think a lot of the world who perhaps uh, would not be as pro-American as I would, or perhaps been 
uh, we've been hoping for some other action to happen. Uh, they were very responsible, they were very slow, I think they were very uh, careful uh, in what way they dealt with it. So uh, I think nobody in, in the Security Council uh, has any difficulty with the actions they've taken. Hi, my name is Nick Smith and I'm a Dublin-born first year at the college. My question is, what are the new obstacles to the peace process? And are the real, real IRA a threat? Um, well, I think the obstacles, more or less what I said, is just to get the trust and momentum into it. And, and I believe that we can get that up. The real IRA, the second part of your question, the real IRA, are clearly a threat. Uh, they had a, a bomb in, in Birmingham uh, last Saturday night. They've had a number of bombs this summer uh, in the United Kingdom. As also, they've attempted uh, actions in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Uh, they've been thwarted so far, but it, it is a, a concern. Uh, they're not a big organisation, but they, they clearly uh, have uh, the capabilities to carry out atrocities, as, as they did previously in OMA. Uh, the biggest atrocity uh, of all the 30 years uh, was back a few years ago uh, in, in OMA. So that continues to be a worry uh, for us. Uh, but I think everybody, uh, except themselves, and in the continuity IRA uh, and some other maybe individuals uh, and some of the loyalist elements uh, who are engaged in, in, in violence as well, uh, they, they are the threat to it. It's not just Republicans, there, there, there are there are loyalist groups as well. Uh, but there, there is, a, I think, a, a spirit by, by nationalist unionists, uh, certainly a lot of loyalists and Republicans to defeat them. So I think if people work together, people hold their nerves, uh, then we can overcome that. But they are a threat. Uh, Mr. Taoiseach, as you can probably tell from my dulcet tones, I'm from Belfast. Um, welcome. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your speech. I'm a visiting professor here in the law school. Uh, two related questions. First, you've been keen to stress the historical nature of the IRA's move on arms, rightly in my view. Um, how do you think history will judge the calibre of the current Sinn Féin leadership in delivering that? And second and related point, can you envisage a situation where you will be in government in the Republic with the same leadership? Well, on, on the first issue, uh, I, I do acknowledge um, what, what, the, what the IRA did and what the Sinn Féin leadership convinced them to do, because I think that's, that's what happened, in, in effect, as, you, as you've said. Um, they had to uh, persuade them of, of the benefits of, of this strategy, and that was not easy. Uh, I know, I think, fairly well uh, the, the story behind all of that. but. Uh, no need to say any more than it, it was it's a difficult thing and still is difficult because you have to try to carry people with you and uh, it's no good splintering the movement. Uh, I think history will be kind to the to the uh, to Jerry Adams, Martin McGuinness, to the uh, parallel uh, twin leadership of the two of them from uh, all the way back uh, since 1998. Uh, they're that long at it. Uh, we've worked with them in my party uh, more or less since that time, particularly for the last seven or eight years, uh, and I think they have done a, a good job. Uh, the, their ultimate goal, and certainly the, the, what we would all aspire to, is to see the day where uh, the Sinn Féin leadership uh, can convince uh, the uh, IRA and those associated with it to uh, wrap up uh, totally and, and disband uh, and be out of existence uh, fully and completely. And I think that will change the, uh, the position until that happens. Um, you, you could not, uh, in, in the South, uh, under our constitution, uh, deal with Sinn Féin because they uh, still recognise and are associated with the IRA. Uh, and, and under our constitution, you can only have one army and one police force. And of course, Sinn Féin uh, at, at the moment are not in that position. Uh, but uh, in fairness to Gerry Adams and, and to Martin McGuinness, they are on record several times, and I think three times this year, of saying that is what they're ultimately working for. Um, my name is Derville McHenry. I'm a senior at Harvard College. Um, I was thinking Ireland is finally getting to the end of a process that's only just beginning in Israel and the Palestinian territories. I was wondering what advice you would have for the Israeli government, both in terms of day-to-day -day security operations and an overall peace process. Well, uh, I've had a number of discussions on, on, on this issue um, re recently, and it's hard, it's hard to put it into a, into a, a, few, a, a few words. but. I, I suppose if you have a, a peace process, uh, you have to stick, to stick with it. Uh, if I can give you the, the best uh, example, I, I recall uh, back in 1993, uh, it was a terrible Irish people that are here will remember the 
a famous bombing in the uh, uh, of a butcher shop, a butcher shop, so vegetable shop on the Shankill Road, a large number of people, uh, including the bomber, uh, were killed. Now we had to follow, I think, Israeli strategy. Uh, we would have cut all all um, means of negotiations and go back to start. Uh, to, to say in a peace process, in my view, I don't claim to be an expert, but in my view, I haven't watched all that we've happened, uh, that um, you're, you're, all the time you have to preconditions, and if you expect, uh, if I expect the, the Dean, who is doing his best to, to control people, uh, that he has to control and stop every single act uh, before I'll talk to him. I just think that's impossible. In our context, we, 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 would, be, we would be back 10 years, not where we are now, if we had to follow that. Uh, I, I just believe it, it is illogical and unworkable. Um, and I don't say that in any critical way, I just don't think it'll work. And I, I, my advice is that you have to build a process and you have to build trust. It, it doesn't mean when you're dealing with somebody in a process that you love them. And normally they never will actually in these things. You'll never love them even after a generation. Uh, but at least you have to believe uh, that the process, that the people in it are working. And uh, I, I, I um, do not know, know uh, Sharon, but I, 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 I have um, Simon Perez uh, and, and I've met Mr. Arafat, I've, I've met both of them on a number of occasions uh, and I, I would believe that both of them want to do business and I think both of them can do business uh, and I just hope uh, that they can uh, work to do that but if you try to solve the security situation all before you start the process, uh, if, the, if that was the one bit of advice, I, 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 if I was here tonight saying to them, I'd appeal to them not to do that because I don't think that would work. Good evening Taoiseach. Um, my name is Dennis Duggan from Tipperary. Um, I'm just passing through to Harvard tonight. Um, my, my mother is probably one of those people who said to say hello and, and come home. Um, firstly, I'd just like to um, pass on my congratulations to you and the entire government on the, on the overwhelming uh, success that that's, we've seen in the peace process, particularly on October 23rd. I have just two very brief questions, one related and the other not at all. Uh, one, one question for Christopher. Uh, um, Ireland's uh, been experiencing a boom, as everybody knows, over the last 10 years. But uh, according to um, an OECD report published in 1997 entitled Youth in the 21st Century, Ireland has had a unemploy youth unemployment rate of 21%, um, which is by ILO standards quite high, given that um, general unemployment was less than 5%. I'm just wondering uh, what strategies um, have been implemented to maybe counteract that. And secondly... No, if you, do, if you have a second question, that young lady will not have the last question. So <laughs> I, I just want to know, no, does he still have the vision it. that he'll see United that's Ireland it. before the end of his life? That's it. One question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, Dennis. Dennis, I, I think... We're, we're down now. Our, our long-term unemployment is only about one and a half percent. All unemployment in Ireland and, and everywhere else, I think, is going to is going to rise for the for the next number of months, but hopefully not too much. Uh, what we have been particularly doing, our, our youth unemployment uh, is by and large in in more disadvantaged areas, and, and all our labour market programmes, our training programmes, uh, are now designed to to try to uh, bring up the educational levels and the skill levels in those communities. We've a, we've a number of schemes and a number of resources to try to, uh, to, to just help the education uh, of the less well-off because it is our view, as, as you know, uh, but right, right throughout the, the difficult areas uh, to, to use education as the best vehicle uh, to, to, to bring up the standards. And um, our policies are very much now geared, uh, regardless of whether it's, for, whether it's trades, crafts, or uh, unskilled labour or whatever, uh, it's, it's to go in there and try and give people uh, the, the motivation uh, and the, the skills uh, to, to bring them up. Uh, and we're, we're putting an enormous amount of, of expenditure now into the disadvantaged areas to do that. Uh, and that's the only way I think we'll, we'll overcome the, the, the levels of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment. And this will have to be the last question. Hello, Taoiseach. Um, my name is Michelle Hardy, and I'm from West Belfast. I'm currently studying for a master's at the law school here. As one of the so-called children of the Troubles, um, I've watched with increased frustration over the years as each time a settlement's tried to be reached, there are certain people on the unionist side who seem to want to do everything they can to stop it. Our first problem was that there was going to be no talks until there were ceasefires. 
then the whole decommissioning obstacle was put in the way. And now that we actually have decommissioning, there are people still on the unionist side who, as we've seen recently with the, the no men of the DUP and the dissident unionists such as Weir and Armitage, refusing to accept the decommissioning has actually occurred and continuing to to say no and in their favourite tone. I was wondering if you think that this is just a reflection that no matter what concessions the Republican movement makes or Ireland makes, that these people are never, simply just do not want to share power with nationalists and will not only be happy when it is a government, a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. Well, I, I think, um, Michelle, it, it's, um, actually I think you should go back home and say that to them actually, you've got hit them very well. <laughs> Um, there, there is an element that are precisely that way, Michelle, but I think there are declining uh, elements. There, there, there is a, a lobby within the DUP, and I suppose probably a lobby also uh, within militant republicanism that just want to say no to all sides. But I, I think your generation, I think even older generations, are fed up with that, you know. And I really, they're, they're just, they're, they're just, you know, dragging on with the same endless thing. It was interesting last uh, Friday and uh, the, the speeches that of the negative speeches, there wasn't one suggestion. It was just that this won't work, this can't work, this is a bad idea, this is a hopeless idea, we shouldn't be doing it, uh, but never in all terms. And, you know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you're not going to fool all the people all the time, and I don't think the people of Northern Ireland are going to be fooled, fooled by that negative politics. And particularly if there's cross-community. I, I, the, the great thing now is that there's a chance of SDLP, Mark Durkin, uh, Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, um, David Trimble and Reg MP you know, working together. Uh, they'll still be separate parties, but if they're working together, I think the ordinary people, regardless of what they come from, of, of every religion and none, will see that this is an opportunity uh, of moving forward, Michelle. And, and I hope that's it. The, I don't think the negative people will go away. In actual fact, I think some of them will, will be saying no surrender. Um, in 50 years' time, but I think we have to just keep on going and, and hope that the No Surrender lobby uh, gets a, a smaller lobby. Well, Taoiseach, I must say that before you arrived, you were described to me as a man who combined vision and pragmatism, and I must say that your message tonight has shown both, and we're in your debt for having shared it with us. Please join me in thanking Bertie Ahern.